Thank you for coming. We're really excited for this program today. It's about copyright and social justice and how they work together. Today, we are going to have a really exciting program with a bunch of different presenters that have different perspectives on how copyright and social justice work together. In the Copyright Office, we have adopted as our touchstone recently that copyright is the engine of free expression, something that came from Sandra Day O'Connor's opinion in a Supreme Court case. That is something that is incredibly important to us and we think is shown with social justice and copyright as well. Because sometimes it's harder to get your word out when you are from a historically disadvantaged community and things can get more complex. Copyright, and I like this microphone apparently, um, but, <laughs> But basically, copyright helps people who are from historically disadvantaged communities have empowerment and be able to have the way, decide the way they want to share and develop their works with the world. And it comes with some, with some work that people need to do to make sure that they get the word out and understand what's going on. And today we're going to really explore that a lot. But first, without further ado, I want to introduce um, Congressman Jeffries. We are very excited that he's here today. He's the perfect person to come and begin our program. He is the, um, the representative for the 8th District of New York. He is the fifth highest ranking Democrat in the House. He has served on the House Judiciary and Budget Committees, and he has also been, formerly was the whip of the Congressional Black Caucus. He also has a little bit of news today where he's working on other things, but today we're focusing on social justice and copyright. Um, he has extensive, extensive experience with social justice matters, everything from um, the Sandy aftermath relief to criminal justice reform. And he also is an expert in copyright and intellectual property. For example, just last year, he helped, he was instrumental in the passage of the Music Modernization Act. And uh, I think we have some construction perhaps going on behind us. Um, the Music Modernization Act. And he also was the sponsor of the Case Act, which deals with small claims works and finding an alternative tribunal for them, that actually passed almost unanimously out of the House this past fall. So without further ado, please help me welcome Professor um, Congressman Jeffries. Thank you so much. Katie, thank you for, so much for the very uh, generous introduction, of course. And uh, to Maria, the acting registrar, and each and every one of you to the Copyright Office. We're so thankful uh, for you. Uh, it's good to see such a robust uh, turnout for this very important panel discussion uh, on another quiet day on the Hill. <laughs> but in many ways, um, you know, the announcement that the speaker made in some ways, which of course relates solemnly to our constitutional responsibilities, ties directly into what I've always prized so much about copyright. And when I first was assigned to the House Judiciary Committee, and I've served uh, on the committee from the moment that I arrived in Congress in 2013, all the way through this present moment, the Judiciary Committee uh, is often known for uh, its partisan uh, dynamics as it relates to the issues where we have jurisdiction gun ownership rights, immigration rights, voting rights, civil rights, women's rights, reproductive rights. These are not necessarily issues where Democrats and Republicans see eye to eye. But there was a long history of both sides of the aisle working together in the intellectual property space. And many, even within Congress, wonder why does the Judiciary Committee have this jurisdiction? Well, it's for the same reasons that we have jurisdiction over those other issues, because fundamentally, in the copyright space, as you all know, the power to create a robust intellectual property system stems directly from the Constitution. Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8 giving Congress the ability to create that system in order to promote the progress of science and useful arts. I assume I quoted that provision correctly. <laughs> and so 
our responsibility stems from, from that seminal decision that was made by the framers of the Constitution as to the importance of intellectual property and certainly the importance of copyright. And when you combine that with the issue of social justice, because America is not a perfect country, we're an imperfect country, we're working toward being a more perfect union. That's what this journey has been all about, year after year, decade after decade, century after century. Uh, providing the ability to historically marginalize or disenfranchise communities, communities of color struggling to be fully incorporated as part of the American dream, and utilizing the space of copyright so central to the founding of the republic in the vision of the framers of the Constitution because of the centrality of creativity and the centrality of incentivizing creators to share their brilliance with the world. And as someone who has been involved in trying to shape public sentiment or public policy for the good, I also know that speeches from the floor of the House of Representatives, particularly when only C-SPAN was covering it, and I can probably only count on my mother to watch, <laughs> is one thing for all of us. But when you have creatively brilliant Americans confronting and addressing issues of our society or in the social justice space, when you open up the opportunity for people to copyright their work of every background, regardless of race or region or religion or gender or sexual orientation, that is for the good of America. Uh, and so I'm thankful uh, to the Copyright Office, thankful uh, to this wonderful panel. I'm going to run back over to the House of Representatives at this moment, and I yield back the balance of my time. <laughs> Thank you so much to the Congressman. We know that he has a very busy schedule, and we are so happy that he was able to carve out some time to talk about this incredibly important issue. Um, I'm going to hand it over now to Whitney Lewandowski, who is an attorney advisor here at the Copyright Office, who is going to lead a discussion about um, all the various issues that we have with social justice and copyright, and we'll also be taking some questions and answers later on in the event. Whitney? Yes. Hi. I'd like to invite our panel up on stage uh, to join me. Yeah. How you doing? How you doing? Oh, we're live. Yes. Uh, oh. <laughs> I think that's the opposing party. <laughs> <laughs> the infringers. <laughs> All right. Well. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, as Katie mentioned, my name is Whitney Lewandowski. Um, I'm the attorney advisor uh, in the Copyright Office, and I'd like to welcome our panel uh, today. Um, as Representative Jeffries mentioned, we have an amazing group of people today to talk to these issues uh, directly about copyright and social justice. Um, so I will, I will go beginning with my left. I've got uh, Bob Brownis of uh, George Washington University. Um, I have Hollis Wongware, a uh, singer-songwriter, spoken word poet, and activist. Uh, Kim Tignor of the Intellectual Property and Social In Institute of Intellectual Property it's and Social mouthful. Justice, or IIPSJ. <laughs> Perfect. There we go. All right, and I've got Latif Matima, a professor at uh, Howard University and founder of the IIPSJ. Um, so again, thank you so much for joining uh, today. Uh, we'll be in discussing the intersection of copyright and social justice. Uh, these concepts are connected in many ways. Um, in our registration records here at the office, um, in information outreach, in patterns of infringement and access to justice, uh, and in the ability to access copyright office services. Um, so social justice issues affect creators and users and everyone who is involved in the copyright space. Um, that's creators, policymakers, administrators, random people off the street, 
um, copyright and social justice, they matter every day. Um, so I would like to, to, to kick off uh, our conversation by directing uh, a, a, a question to Professor Matima um, to kind of be a framer. Um, so as a founder of the IIPSJ, you recognize the need uh, for uh, work in the area of social justice and intellectual property early on. So could you start off with a pre brief definition? Um, what is social justice and uh, how do these issues come into play in the copyright system? Yeah, well thank you um, and thanks everyone uh, for coming. This is such an in incredible uh, turnout. I feel like I'm the lead singer of a rock band. I, mean, <laughs> yeah, I don't see this very often. Maybe you should try. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Don't give me the opportunity. <laughs> the, uh, I think actually uh, Congressman Jeffries really summed it up, right? I mean, if you think about the intellectual property clause in the Constitution, and you think about the, uh, the social utility mission of copyright in our society, you know, the whole point of it is to foster creativity, to foster expressive endeavor, and to enable society to get as much of that as possible and for it to be as beneficial as possible. Well, see, the thing of it is, though, is that in order to accomplish that, you literally need contribution from everybody in society. You know, the metaphor that I'm most fond of is that if, if you were to go out and to buy a piece of land and you found that you were getting a yield only from a portion of the land, you know, two-thirds of the land was producing crop, the other third wasn't, well, the first thing you're going to want to do is you're going to want to find out why. Okay? You want all of it to be productive. You want to be able to draw upon all of the resources that are available to you. And so that's why a social justice perspective of copyright is so important. You, it has to be broadly inclusive. You know, we want expression from every sector of, of society. And the reason that we began to really think about the intersection of social justice and how it connects with copyright and how it promotes copyright is because what, what I found uh, back in, in, in my practice days was that if you spoke with most people who were participants and stakeholders in the copyright system, most people were aware of the imperfections of copyright on the ground, of historic traditions of unfair exploitation, copyright injustice, uh, creators from marginal uh, uh, communities in society, their work being produced, their work being pirated, uh, those people not receiving either the economic benefits or the appropriate attribution. And what I found was that most IP practitioners and other stakeholders, they were aware of that, and they also agreed that it was not a good thing, right? But the thing of it is, the, the barrier was that too many people had a misunderstanding of what is oftentimes referred to as a law and economics perspective of copyright. And in other words, that, well, your economic rewards and incentives are sacrosanct. And whatever the problem is, whatever the trouble is, you can't risk um, in any way altering that, in any way lessening that. Because if you think about anything other than economic reward, if you think about any other issue whatsoever, you're going to tamper with copyright, you're going to disrupt copyright, and you're going to make copyright dysfunctional. So what we really needed to do is we needed to make that connection that Con Congressman Jeffries made. That, yes, economic incentives are important, but there are other issues in terms of promoting the progress of arts and, and sciences in our society that are equally important, that also impact whether or not we achieve those objectives. And so what we needed to do was to think about copyright and think about the IP system as a whole as something, as a system that in order for it to achieve its objectives, we have to re-envision it as a system that requires inherent principles or inherent precepts of socially equitable access, inclusion, and empowerment, right? Everybody has to have an opportunity to contribute to the uh, copyright storehouse of, of our society. And everyone is going to participate if everyone has an equal opportunity, and if everyone has the same opportunity to derive and share in the benefits that can flow from that. Now, of course, in addition, everyone has to be included not only in terms of access, but everyone, uh, access to the system, but everyone also has to have access to the fruits of expressive endeavor. 
because the fruits of, of expressive endeavor, they have a dual purpose, right? We love to enjoy them. We love to be inspired by them. We, we love to learn from them. And that leads to the second purpose. They inspire us to create our own expressive works and then to re-contribute back to society and to ignite that cycle and to get it started all over again. And if everyone is participating in this cycle, right, not only do we have a more effective copyright regime, ah, but we also have copyright social justice. right? And when we see that some people are being excluded or denied or treated unfairly, we recognize that that is not solely a question of generic social injustice. It is also a condition of copyright injustice because it is impeding the function and the role of what copyright is supposed to do. Copyright is supposed to get us all of the expressive endeavor from everyone. And one of the things that has enabled this society to be the premier intellectual property society in, in the world. So that's kind of where this stuff all sort of comes together. And I think the other panelists um, are all actually taking that from a theoretical perspective and to making that happen. Absolutely, and so I actually um, I wanted to turn to, to Hollis and um, Professor Matima had had touched on some um, issues of empowerment and and access, and so you as a member of the creative community and who is you know actively charged with creating that wonderful abundance of, of copyright in America. Can you tell us about your journey, um, your experience with understanding copyright and how that's influenced the way that you, you operate as a creator? Certainly, thanks. Um, well, it's kind of funny because the genesis of my kind of copyright awakening as a creator actually was from Professor Matima himself. Um, so four years ago, I was part of this Google um, Next Gen Policy Leaders Conference and I was sitting feeling just completely out of sorts. I was with all of these leaders in policy and tech policy and I was there as a content creator and a songwriter. I had produced some music videos that had done well on YouTube and I'd written some songs and had, was trying to finagle myself a career in songwriting but otherwise I felt like a fish out of water and super imposter syndrome, all of that. So I was sitting there in this conference room and Professor Matima gets up and starts talking about IP and social justice and it was this like slow lightning bolt moment where I was just like, oh, I, I create IP, I generate, I generate copyright. And I had never really saw myself, I think as a songwriter um, and as a musician, you never really feel like there's a dignity to it <laughs> oftentimes. I think it's, it's, it's hard to find that. Um, and I also was just really provoked by um, Professor Matima's charge that, you know, historically throughout the generations of the United States, like, you know, historically, marginalized communities have been dispossessed of their intellectual property and have been barred from accessing intellectual property. And that's so clear and I think it, it cre creates real weight to the notion of cultural appropriation which often sometimes mm -hmm. feels like this very nebulous conversation and an opinionated conversation when really you can look historically through the ages and say, oh yes, there's actually been exploitation of and denial of copyright ownership to the communities that have, surprise, been historically <laughs> marginalized and um, disenfranchised throughout. Um, so that was really my awakening because I realized, oh, I'm not just sitting here on the sidelines as my role as a musician isn't just so I can write a protest song about something that I feel passionate about. Um, I, I actually have a role here in, in being an advocate, not only for myself and to better understand how to protect my own copyright that I create, and to really more fundamentally recognize that there is inherent value in copyright creation. I think oftentimes artists, especially in our fluctuating and volatile creative economies can often feel like we are lucky to have the opportunities that we have. That if we are, you know, if we enter into a business agreement with a record label or a publishing company in the musician's example, um, that we have been chosen but that we are not fundamental to the enterprise itself. And so really from that one moment four years ago when I saw Professor Matima speak, it's been a journey for me to better understand how creators need to be centered um, and, and honored and and provided the dignity that we deserve in these conversations, um, that we are not incidental to these creative economies, but instead central to and fundamental to these creative economies. Um, and fr from that, just recognizing how little education, accessible education there is for folks like myself, where I feel like I'm in a very top percentile in terms of like access to educa like educational privileges and access, and even still it's difficult for me to, to understand 
uh, what is a compulsory me mechanical license? What am I entitled to? And what, um, you know, how can I challenge if I don't feel that I'm getting paid my just dues with royalties? Um, these are all really thorny issues, and they're very dry, but what I've really found, they've, or they're seemingly dry, but what I've found, <laughs> what I've found, <laughs> they're actually really juicy. Yeah. <laughs> and, when you, and when you start looking at things, and it creates so much context, with, with musicians, we all love music, we all love pop culture, we have musicians that we love, and when you start kind of overlaying the framework of copyright ownership, when you start looking at Prince's catalog and thinking about his fight against his major label, and what the ownership of his master compositions meant to him, or his master recordings meant to him, right? And the idea that copyright is power, copyright is dignity, copyright is the value, our inherent value as creators, even in a market, in an economy, in a capitalist society that won't necessarily value us for what it is, we can actually start to build up artists to feel in control, to make educated decisions, to want to be in the room and understand the contracts that they're signing and not feel like you need a third party to decode it. Um, so it's, it's energized me as a creator and it's really made me passionate about the idea of creating education that is accessible and exciting um, and, and really directly connective to the next generation of creators that can feel like, uh, you know, that they understand how to navigate this world. Great, thank you. And so, uh, Kim, um, you know, Hollis talks about um, centering the artist and making the artist aware that they are fundamental to the enterprise of copyright and the copyright system. Um, and she also talked about decoding. Um, so a lot of your work is about going, you know, out into people where they are, meeting them and helping them, giving them resources to do the decoding. What strategies have you found effective? Um, what type of information do you find people really latch on to and find to be juicy? Yeah, well, I was going to completely add and build upon the juicy uh, <laughs> adjective, which is, you know, so what we found, just to give you guys some background, we at the at IIPSJ, which is a mouthful, um, but we started an initiative called Take Creative Control, and what we do is we go into creative communities, we go right to the center of it, and we create this moment where we have conversations about copyright, about the ability for people to share, protect, or monetize their creative works. We decode, we make it a point to make the conversation as juicy as possible. <laughs> we look for those magical moments in pop culture where folks may not be aware that the conversation is really about intellectual property and really about you know copyright trademark, right? And connect those dots. So when we have Chance the Rapper talking about how difficult it is to understand what copyright is, or when we have Nipsey Hussle talking about the importance of owning your work. When you don't quite understand why your why De La Soul is not available on streaming platforms. These are all conversations in intellectual property. And so what we're constantly looking for is an opportunity to connect those dots um, for creators and for folks that want to create that want to support creators. And I think that that's what it's all about. And and it has been why I feel like our, my friendship and partnership with Hollis has been so magical because as a lawyer, as a policy wonk, there are a lot of things that just don't occur to me, right? There's a language, there's just a whole side of my brain that has been asleep um, and has been awakened yeah. a little. Um, and it, it, to really understand how, um, how these issues really impact a creative and what it means and how important it is to um, control it and what it means to feel like you don't have control of your works, right? And the violation that comes with that. Um, and so what we really make it a point to do is that we go into these communities, we do a lot of outreach, we do a lot of education leading up to it, and we do it in a space that's palatable and where people are. I feel like that is like our mantra, is we wanna go where the creatives are and we want to engage them in ways that they like to be engaged. That's a lot of social media. Mm -hmm. That is a lot of funny, snarky points um, and making it as juicy as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and so we've had a lot of success in reaching out to these communities uh, through just authentic partnerships and just really being creative in the way that we try to honor our, our creators. Yeah, thank you. And, and Bob, um, I'd be interested uh, to, to hear you talk a little bit about um, the work that you've done in, in analyzing the paper trail. Um, so analyzing the records of the Copyright Office or, or jurisprudence and to hear you talk about where, um, where people are connecting with the copyright system, where people might be still left out. Um, what type of observations have you, have you made 
um, through your research? Well, the, the, uh, the, the primary piece of research that, that I and a colleague at the uh, University of Virginia, Dotan Oliar, did is to analyze 35 years of copyright registrations, um, the records of which were all right here in this building, um, and uh, to understand uh, the demographics uh, of uh, those registrations, to understand um, the race, ethnicity, gender, and age of creators as they're reflected in the records, understanding that the records may not be completely accurate reflections of creation itself, right? Um, but within those records, uh, we definitely found that there are some populations that are underrepresented. So, um, you know, perhaps most dramatically, um, Hispanic authors are represented at less than half of what the average rate of copyright uh, creation is uh, in, the, in the country. And um, that's, that's huge, right? That's very dramatic. Uh, we tried to see, obviously, any statistic, any single statistic gives you a very narrow look at things and the world is complicated. So you try to correct and see, well, are there other reasons why that might be occurring? Um, and we tried to correct for various things like age um, and so forth. And you know, even correcting a uh, underrepresentation on that level um, just doesn't seem like it, it can be uh, corrected for. So, um, and then you know, thinking of uh, uh, gender, um, over the 35 year period, uh, about two thirds of authors are male and only about a third are uh, female. That actually at least shows some change and improvement in some areas. Uh, it was 70% in 1978 and it was 64% in 2012. So not a huge sea change, but you know, change perhaps in the right direction. Um, but then you dig in deeper into different kinds of works of authorship and you find that the improvement there or the change there um, came mainly in some categories and not in others. So literary works, a very large category, uh, a great um, change in female authorship. It represents, females then off, uh, represent about 46% of uh, registrations by 2012. Um, music, uh, female authors represented about 15% in 1978 and about 15% in 2012. Um, uh, music is another big category of registration. So, um, and you know, that points to the fact that hmm, there, barriers and traditions may be different in different industries, right. and we may have to um, you know look differently in those in those different areas. As far as what the copyright office can do, I think it represents and it represents opportunities. I I love Latif's you know metaphor of fallow ground, right? Wow, you've located some ground out there that may be able to burst forth mm -hmm. in great uh, um, uh, production and uh, in, in great fertility if only um, you bring education, right? And of course, Encouraging people to be creators, that's a task that goes way beyond copyright. And the reasons why underrepresented minorities may be creating less uh, is, is something that is copyrights connected to the whole society and everything that's going on. But the reasons that they may not exploit their works in a, in, 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 in a sort of just way, where they may not understand how to protect their works and how to how to engage in um, deal making uh, and engage in registration, that's something that's much more specifically copyright, right? And so the, the Office of um, uh, Public Information and Education, right, has, um, always has its work cut out for it, but to identify areas and say, wow, there's, there's a lot of Hispanics out there who might be able to learn something more about copyright. And there might even be a language barrier that we need to overcome mm -hmm. um, to do that. So that's a, that, that seems to me a great area of opportunity. Yeah, and you know, I, I think of the registration records you know, as a reflection of an in-state process, right? So registration records are created after someone has created a work and then affirmatively identified themselves as a copyright owner and then sought out to, to register their work and make it part of the public record. Absolutely. And that connects back to something that Hollis said, you know, when she was sitting in that room and she's like, oh, wait a second, I'm an intellectual property creator. Yeah. Whoa, 
Um, and so I'm sitting up on a stage now, and Hollis also, you know, pointed out that you know she's, we are all on stage, you know, very well educated in copyright, right? So we we know um, how to, you know, we know about the rights, we know about ownership, we know about authorship. How do we bring other people into the fold, right? So how do we uh, bring information out? How do we encourage people to come along the journey of copyright knowledge with us? And I'll just open that up. Well, so I kind of want to respond to, I feel like, yeah. the last point. Is, and that is, I think that there's another thing that's happening. Um, in addition to the education, which is critically important, I think we need to kind of face head on the fact that there's a culturalization that happens where marginalized communities are just, they absorb the idea that their ideas are not of value, mm -hmm. right? And so it kind of links almost to the idea of what they're creating, they wouldn't even think to assign a legal term to it, mm -hmm. right? To right. say, this is intellectual property, this is something of value. So it's even, I mean, it, and that is what one of the critical challenges that we've found in doing our outreach is to get folks in the room, right? And then, you know, one of the things that we offer is that if you're able to sit down with a, a lawyer and have that conversation, you would think that folks would jump at that opportunity. But again, there's a threshold because a lot of marginalized communities, a lot of folks, they do not want, they don't, feel that it's, that they're ready to have a conversation with a lawyer. That, oh, well, you know, I, my idea's only half-baked, I don't know if I, and so it's just even getting over that hurdle, right? Yeah. To have folks recognize um, the, the value and the impact that their creative works have mm -hmm. um, is a real challenge, but an important one that we address in parallel with the education. Okay, so it's even you know, bringing people along and, and sort of, I guess, what Professor Matima was talking about at the beginning is, is to kind of, uh, recognize or have people recognize that they are uh, part of the same ground, they're part of the same landscape as everyone else. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think part of it, there are a couple of sort of historical, traditional hurdles that we have to, to, to break through. I think Kim articulated uh, how some of them impact, impact the situation. I think, you know, speaking, you know, broadly, one of the first things is, in terms of your work, of course, getting people into the room, once you get them into the room, uh, one of the other things that we have to do is to dispel this notion that copyright is the enemy, right? Because for most people in marginalized communities, um, uh, the notion is the only thing I know about copyright is that that's usually what is pointed to as to why I'm not getting paid, right? And the thing of it is, is that copyright is not about that at all, right? Copyright is not the enemy. Right? In fact, copyright utilized properly when you have proper education and understand how it works and what it can do for you and what it's intended to do for you, copyright really is a very handy tool. Copyright, <laughs> to put it in a way that I used to see, you know, reading is fundamental. Copyright is your friend. Right? <laughs> okay? And the thing of it is, that's one of the reasons why so many of the people who are with us here today, I know a number of you work at the Copyright Office. And there are moments in which you are working with people, you are talking with people, you're answering their questions, and sometimes you might even feel a little bit guilty. You say, wow, like, am I being too helpful? Am I being like a copyright evangelist, right? <laughs> like, should I be doing this on the company dime? Absolutely yes, okay? That work that you're doing to bridge that gap, to bridge that connect, connection, to help the people engage in the process of human actualization, which is what copyright is intended to foster, right? You are doing your job triple time, right? And indeed, not to get in trouble, you probably deserve a bonus. <laughs> <laughs> right? I'm not in charge of that. So, <laughs> so, I think that once you enable people to re-envision what copyright is, right, then other more fantastic things begin to happen. Not only do they start to make better use of it, not only do they start to do some of the work as what Hollis is doing, is saying, wait, this is not just for me. I'm going to go out and tell all my artists and creative friends, yeah, let's get involved. But then you start to develop a grassroots movement. You get people involved and being concerned and caring about the copyright system, caring about copyright law, caring about copyright law and policy the same way they care about education law and policy, the same way they care about voting law and policy. They begin to understand right, that in the 21st century, intellectual property, copyright expressive <laughs> endeavor, that is the coin of the realm. right? 
That is what is going to determine what kind of society we have, not only from a technological standpoint. You know, Jules Verne envisioned vessels that would go underwater, and eventually we have the submarine, right? Or as I was saying to my copyright class yesterday, you know, I could stand up and I could say to people, hey, we all ought to treat each other better. We all ought to recognize that human beings, we're all the same, we're all equal, we ought to be respectful. Or you could express those same sentiments the way that Martin Luther King did it in the I Have a Dream speech, right? That's the power of expressing ideas, and that's what makes all the difference. And as people begin to make that connection, you have people becoming involved in helping to determine what kind of copyright system, what kind of copyright regime we have. And as a result, that means what kind of society and culture that, that, that we'll also have. Sure. Um, I actually just wanted to kind of uh, describe if anybody hasn't been to a Take Creative Control event yet, the um, initiative uh, and program that Kim founded. It's really this dynamic event where you go and there's live music, there's a DJ, there's food, there's drink, there's, it's just, it's a place you want to be and it's a place you want to connect with people and, as, and it's a panel conversation and there's, lawyers on deck and so it's like it's there's there's a there's a rigor to it um, but at the same time like how do we enliven these conversations how do we enliven these environments because it's not just this kind of like recreational like fun veneer it actually has to do with like the dynamic of the discourse and the fact that it's a two-way street like as, as you and I have talked about it's it's not as if I, I think that what I've realized is a lot of copyright education for artists is very didactic um, and it kind of takes this scholastic approach when really it should be a dynamic conversation because I think policymakers and um, legal scholars and people who are experts in copyright have so much to learn from people who generate copyright. Even if they're at the very beginning of their awareness and understanding of being able to articulate that they're creating copyright to begin with, the real life struggles of artists to support their work um, and what it looks like in the field on the ground day in, day out, best practices for artists to better communicate with each other about um, thoughtful co-creation. Um, all of these things are, are so deeply, they're rich, they're nuanced. There's a sophistication of our experiences as creators that maybe we don't know how to express within the terms that, you know, like in the keywords or, or within the um, academic discourse that copyright is usually laden in. But I really think that there's, there's opportunity for these conversations to really come to life in a way that enriches and it's not just like this fun ploy to get people to understand how to protect their copyright, but it's actually towards the advancement of the work that we're all trying to do, which is empowering creators. Um, and I really think Take Creative Control is like a, it's, it's the, it's a groundwork and like a petri dish for seeing what's possible. And again, it's juicy, it's fun. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, and, and it also just like, yeah, bringing these things to life. I think the research work that you do is so fantastic because it's so important to point, like when you hear such a stark term in that, and it's supported by other research, um, I'm thinking especially of the Annenberg um, Center at USC where they do really extensive research on looking on for women creators specifically um, and who owns what they do. And if anything, like it's, it's both distressing but also um, affirming to hear those statistics and, and that research because it makes me realize that how difficult it feels to be a woman in the music industry is actually validated. <laughs> um, I'm like, there is data. <laughs> it's not just my feelings. Um, but I think that I think all of that said, um, I'm really interested in, in what it looks like, especially now with the MMA having passed, with the MLC um, coming to be, and the fact that um, artists need to you know proactively register in order to be recipients of their copyright. I mean, now more than ever, it's not now it's not just like for fun. Now it's for real. Like <laughs> like artists education the time is now um, okay. in a really critical way and there there's an opportunity and I think hopefully we can walk towards the opportunity feeling really good about our ability that in today's digital age we have the opportunity to reach music creators um, and meet them where they're at um, you know there's also like a, a fear that this will only widen the um, disparity 
And, and now, obviously, there's a lot of really good stuff in the MMA. But to be honest, even with the incredible level of access that I have, the fact that I'm on stage today, I'm still decoding and trying to pick apart and even trying to figure out how to describe MMA in lay terms, you know? So how, how are we working on that? And how are we utilizing creators as ambassadors and um, points of knowledge, not just as the veneer, not just as the hook, but as really as like the, as the points of expertise? How are we honoring the expertise of the experience of creators? And then how are we imbuing them to be uh, points of reference and, and be equal members at the table as we talk about how to protect copyright moving forward? And Bob, um, I wanted to just, um, the, the, the question of like, how, um, how do we bring people into the fold? You know, we've heard uh, meeting people where they're at. Um, we've heard, um, you know, helping them to decode and to center the artist. Um, and I just wanted to make, see if uh, there was any other, any other thoughts. Um, well, a couple of other thoughts. I guess one, one uh, is on the, the access to content side, the inspiration side that uh, Latif was talking about. You know, that a lot of things that the, that copyright policy making does and that the Copyright Office does is work towards um, easier licensing arrangements to get stuff out um, easier. And, we, in, and in, in connection with the you know, Music Modernization Act, the ability to have advertising supported on demand access to libraries of music that are in the millions of songs is huge. It's not the only thing. People also have to have devices that can, um, can you know, get those streams. Uh, people also have to understand that they can be creators, all that stuff. But that's a piece of it for sure, right? And. Um, not to be underestimated. So, you know, the folks who are doing direct education are doing copyrights work, but the folks who made it possible to have um, advertising supported on demand libraries available uh, are also doing copyrights work. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and so that actually will lead me to my last question before we open it up to the audience, um, is to talk about the, the change uh, that digital technology brings. Um, and so to ask the group, you know, what are your observations of how digital technology has changed uh, <coughs> ability to access um, or to use intellectual property to access economic power or to leverage economic justice? So I'll, I'll jump in. Sure, thank you. Um, cool. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, I think that there's this really magical moment. And I'm going to answer the question kind of with the overlay of the MMA, right, in this moment that we're presented with. Because, you know, technology has really lowered the threshold for entry and has allowed us to redefine who is the creator, who gets to create, and, and how, we find those, how we find those folks, how they're able to build audiences um, and, and, and reach their followership, right? Um, but with that comes, um, it, it, I would say that there's, there's so much magic in that, but there also comes this responsibility for us to think about, rethink how we're going to do outreach, right? So when we think about the database, we think about registering, you know, those traditional forms of outreach, they're, they're not going, they'll work to a point, but mm -hmm. then we gotta get really creative and really intentional, right? Um, and I mean, I gotta applaud, I mean, th this, I think that this panel is wonderful. I see some of the creative folks that I have tremendous respect for from the DC community in the room, which I would challenge afterwards, I'm gonna ask them how many times they've been down here before, because <laughs> my guess would be, right, this may be their first, second time ever making it down to one of these public, open to the public um, discussions, right? But this is important, and, um, I think that we're really going to have to move with a level of intention in trying to rethink how we do outreach and how we bring people into the fold. Mm -hmm. Okay, so again, so with the the outreach and intersecting with the digital um, digital world, um, some of your your scholarship uh, discusses um, the the balance between increased access, as Bob mentioned, to materials, but then also. Um, a different type of isolation that we might see uh, as a result of digitization. Um, how can we address the populations that still might be getting left out because of our uh, march to digitization and digital access? Yeah, well, uh, certainly, I mean, the digital society, of course, is here to stay, mm -hmm. and so we're not going to be able to turn that, that back. Um, it's important to think about it in a couple of different ways. One way, of course, is to think about that access and to make certain that to the extent that works, for example, works that are born digital, 
right? And they're just not available in any other uh, context. So we have to think about that and think about, you know, we don't want to have one society that has access to everything that is old and out of date and, you know, out of print. And then, then there's the other society that has access to that and everything more. So that's one consideration that we need to, that we need to think about. Uh, but another thing that we have to be conscious about is the fact that we do have to be careful about, as Kim was saying, the decision-making process that, that, that we're making. Um, some of, of Bob's work that he knows that I'm a big fan of is, um, and I wonder if you might uh, talk briefly about it, uh, some of the work that you've done in terms of cover recordings, right? Because although that is something of an unfortunate moment, it helps to highlight this, this issue we're talking about right now about being careful and conscious about the decisions that we're making. Right, uh, because perhaps at that particular moment in time, there were some conscious decisions that were being made that were not good decisions, but there may also have been some unintended consequences mm -hmm. of some of some of those uh, the, the, those decisions. And so it just helps to to indicate to us that when we're talking about uh, new technologies, talking about embodiments of work, talking about um, how do we capture content. How do we disseminate content? How do we share content? Uh, there are always going to be decision-making moments. And if you aren't careful and you make a decision that's too quick, you may derail things a little bit. And so I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit, because you know what I'm talking about, that whole cover situation. Uh, I certainly do. That's what I've been working on for the past week. In fact, I was downstairs in the public reading room yeah. doing some further um, yeah. documentary research about, about that. But, uh, well, the, the, the phenomenon very quickly is one uh, that occurred basically after World War II uh, up through the mid-60s, uh, where uh, Af particularly African-American recording artists would um, make initial recordings of songs, uh, and then uh, white recording artists would follow behind that. and they would uh, not only cover the song, um, which often was notated in very thin form with just a melody and lyrics, but they would also copy all of the arrangement, the orchestration, maybe additional lyrics, uh, additional melody lines that had been added during the process of recording the, uh, the initial version. Uh, and so, uh, and those, those, for various reasons, having to do with uh, racial prejudice, um, those white co mirror covers um, uh, typically were, were more successful than the initial recordings by the African American artists, right? Uh, and so there was a, uh, a kind of test case brought in 19, late 1948 um, to determine whether the African American composers, arrangers, recording artists who were involved with making the initial recording and the recording company that represented them, whether they had any protection for what they added to that thinly notated song, and the answer was no, right? And the answer, and the, and the, the answer being no, it sort of set off this decade of white covers um, without any compensation to the folks who created a lot of that music. Uh, so yeah, I, I am working on a piece that's in a volume that you are co-editing. So that's no wonder. <laughs> it shows, um, it shows you, know, you actually read this stuff when you send it to us. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, uh, I mean, I'm working on a piece that just sort of documents that phenomenon. It says, wow, here's a case where um, you know, the law kind of could have made a difference, mm -hmm. and it did make a difference, but maybe the wrong difference mm -hmm. in not protecting that. Um, and how would we do it if we could have a makeover, right? And how, um, how, how would that work out? So. And, and just to follow up with that, you see how that observation connects back to, to Kim's point. Mm -hmm. Because basically what we did at that point, I mean, in terms of the law, we made a decision that the creative contributions of those people who made the recording sound a particular way had no value, right? right? So all that extra stuff. And if you've ever heard uh, Marvin Gaye's rendition of the Star Spangled Banner, you know what we're talking about, That's right. Mm -hmm. right? 
And I'm gonna, can I just add one thing that I feel like Latif said, as far as like the assignment of value in the tool set, right, mm -hmm. that we wanna give creators. I envision a world or a space, and Hollis, I wanna hear what your response is to this. But it's in that moment, Hollis talks about this, where it's just, you don't wanna be the, the creator that comes into the room and it's like, hey guys, I have this contract, and you know, <laughs> as far as uh, the copyright, this is how I'm thinking we should it assign kills the things. Vibe. Right, it kills the vibe. But I see a world, right, where creators come together, and that is just a, a 10 minute conversation, and they have the tool set to one, have the conversation in a productive way, and two, to understand that that it's okay to have the conversation and, it, and not to let it kill the vibe. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So I guess just we'll end up uh, with uh, your, your follow-up, like what practical sure, toolkits yeah. would you like to be armed with? How Absolutely, far? so I think that, I, I just in general, I mean I could speak at length as to why I feel like the music industry is like predicated upon exploitation of its creators <laughs> all day. Um, but I think that, um, I think in general, like there's obviously a tide that's shifting and if, connecting back to your digital you know, landscape, I mean, the music industry is a perfect example of, I mean, we're, yeah, we, there's no going back. We will never be the same. I think there's arguments that um, digital, while digital distribution of music has both democratized greatly the creation and dissemination of music, it has also very much hollowed out the ability to have a sustainable um, income uh, just based on the way that things are going. And obviously there's a lot of contention with, with big, companies fighting against songwriters and uh, the list goes on. But I think at the end of the day, we have an opportunity within our new digital landscape for, for these tools to be um, accessible. Like what does it look like if we could actually employ app technology for artists to upload um, you know, uh, their works that as soon as they're made to be registered in the copyright office. Like what, how can we utilize digital technology to actually advance and make more simple and make more accessible? Um, and then with recognizing that to your point, like you need a device to access the internet, right? Digital does not, not everybody can just wake up and access digital. How are people accessing digital? How can we actually overlay that with the lens of social justice? How are people who are, you know, um, who don't have full access to digital resources, how can you meet folks where they're at and at the moment of creation and how can we in integrate it um, into a place where it's common practice. It's just inherent practice of a creative act to also um, honor it as property, you know, as they tell us our generation, like it's so unlikely that we'll own a home, but we could own something. We could own <laughs> property. Um, copyright. Um, and so what does it look like to, to really think about that and in, infusing that, that ownership um, and, that, and that paper trail? And I think more, the last thing I was going to say is that oftentimes in music you feel as though the only leverage that you'll have in these conversations is if you have like a really good lawyer, right, which obviously comes with a price tag. So there's obviously this economic um, barrier to protecting your work. Um, so what does it look like for us to shift the conversation to say, no, you know, this, you don't have to have a lawyer at all to have inherent ownership and to have inherent value. And you actually do have leverage mm -hmm. as a creator. And it's not, it's not who's negotiating on your behalf, it's actually like the inherent ownership that you have of this thing, and then how you're able to use that to leverage. I won't say that like now that I've like learned more about copyright that I'm, that I'm not still doing deals with artists where I let go of my copyright. And I think that there's ways that you can actually um, compromise your ownership of your copyright in empowering ways, but then there's ways that feel exploitative, the ways that in which you feel intimidated or you feel as though you're going to lose an opportunity um, and letting go. And I think there's ways of, of, of leveraging or just like knowing the inherent value of what you have and then being able to negotiate in a way that the creator doesn't feel like it takes other people to have to defend on your behalf, but that you yourself can be the first line of defense. Um, so I'm, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing how that evolves. Awesome. <laughs> great. Well, that's a great last line. So we can open it up now for a couple audience questions. I think we have a few minutes. Yes. But I was just wondering if you all have some um, input or advice on how to be responsible users, because I think as much as we have creators, we definitely need users in the copyright system. So those that are using and consuming content, um, what are some, what's some information that you might give to them? Um, how to be responsible in the copyright ecosystem and social justice and considering all those things together. Okay. So responsible use, what does that look like? Well, maybe I'll start off by just saying that I think the reality today is that everyone is both a user and a creator. 
And I think that if you keep that in mind, you know, you will think about the fact that, okay, um, what I do to your work, somebody's going to do to my work tomorrow, right? And if you think about it from that perspective, I mean, years ago, um, I, when I first started teaching about 20 years ago, I, well, I dated myself. The, I, <laughs> I used to, this is when, you know, rap was sort of like still, not emerging, but, you know, really just spreading, you know, out, out to society. And I would say, listen, you know, uh, just think about the guy you sample today, somebody's going to sample you tomorrow, right? So just to just keep that in mind, you know, um, using responsibly means, yes, taking full advantage of the rights that copyright affords you as a user, because copyright cares about everybody, right? It's not just about authors. It's about users. It's about everybody. Everybody has to contribute. It's an entire ecosystem, right? But sometimes, you know, people may, may be a bit myopic in their thought at a particular moment in time and not considering the after effects and the ripples that may flow later. So if you think about yourself as I am not just a creator, I'm also a user. I'm not just a user, I'm also a creator. I think that would kind of foster the type of balanced perspective that I think that all of us who are all a part of this ecosystem need to have. Oh, I see a question behind, Pam. So thank you all for this. This is absolutely amazing. So I think, you know, undoubtedly we exist in this space where culture is commerce. And so I think one of the other aspects to think about when we talk about how underrepresented communities learn that it's okay to monetize their content and that it's not being a sellout, how do you suggest that you start to address some of those strategies? Because especially in like this digital era, you think of, what was the girl who did like the little fleeky eyebrows yeah, thing that then became t-shirts, memes, rap lyrics. Like, how do you start to have a different conversation with people so that they understand that, yes, not only is there inherent value in my work, but I can stay true to my roots, stay true to my culture, and also make a living not just being a starving artist? Okay. <laughs> you notice we all pointed to... <laughs> I mean, I think that, it, 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 so you hit it on the nose, right? And I think that that's a question that we're constantly asking ourselves every time that we have like one of our, our Take Creative Control events, right? Is how is it that we're going to connect the dots for folks and really show them, you know, a proof of concept. We, we, so eyebrows on fleek is a perfect example, right? Of how it's like, listen, this woman had a moment and it went viral. She had no idea about the power of what she was doing. She just put it out there. I mean, that's what we do. We just put things out there, hoping it'll stick, hoping that you know someone will like whatever it is that I'm sharing. Never, never considering the, the impact that it'll have. So for me, what we try to do is just to constantly look for those examples. And it's, I mean, and that's the beautiful thing about tech innovation and this moment, right? By removing gatekeepers that get to assign what is interesting, what is valuable, what is worth sharing, right? We've moved, we've moved those gatekeepers, and now we're putting out there and demonstrating what it is that we want to see. Um, I think that my favorite uh, proof is the, the Issa Rae story, right? Yeah. Where she's literally just putting stuff out on YouTube, creating, 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 building a cult followership. I mean, I, I am, um, I am, right? I am that awkward black girl. But, um, and then, then turning it into an HBO series, being able to walk into HBO with enough leverage to say, let me tell you how I want to do this. And I'm going to show you that I already know what I'm doing because I already got all these folks already behind me. So the way that we try to talk about it is just through examples, you know, and just having those conversations. And again, I, I don't want to beat a dead horse, but it's just having them in parallel, demonstrating value, and then educating folks and empowering them to talk about it in a way that's productive and um, meaningful for them. And I think just like really quickly to tag on to that, I think too, like this kind of comes with the notion of like creators feeling, and it, it, it sounds just kind of simple, but I, it's, a, it's really profound for an artist to or for people who create to feel like, oh no, you're central to this. It's not because you went viral that your idea had value. Like your idea had value and it went viral. That's right. And I think it sounds so simple, but just that repositioning and shifting that paradigm a little bit means the world to people who are inherently creative but don't necessarily see that there's a value attached to it because we're so used to living in our, you know, in our commerce 
society where it's like, oh no, it's only valid when it goes to market. Because at the end of the day, it's like, if somebody's going to profit off of it, it might as well be you, because ideas mean something. Ideas matter, and your idea mattered, and that's the reason why the thing happened. It's not because the thing happened that now you have something of value that you're worth protecting. And so I think just even explaining that, again, sounds simple, deeply profound for <coughs> folks who are, like hate being like just idea people. It just feels so nebulous, but it's like, actually, ideas matter. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Well, thank you. And so I think um, we'll squeeze in one last question. Um, so I work with a number of black women um, who are starting businesses. Black women are starting businesses at the fastest rate. Uh, there are three in particular, Gwen Hurt, Shoe Crazy Wine, Wine Company in Virginia, Cruz and Cozy out of Southeast Washington, D.C., and there's a young lady we just started working with in New Jersey who wants to, op black woman, wants to open a natural cosmetics manufacturing facility. Uh, in New Jersey. You know, we always send these people down to the copyright office. You know, I run minoritifinance.com. They always have a hard time. Cruz and Cozy couldn't get their website copywritten because of some images that were on it, so the thing got rejected. You know, uh, Gwen Hurt, Shoe Crazy Wine, couldn't get her labels copywritten because there was some kind of issue. And mind you, these people can't afford a lawyer. I appreciate the lawyers. I, you know, I get that. Um, so they place themselves at risk because if the company takes off, it's like a lottery ticket. A smart white lawyer will come in and look at a flaw in their copyright application and then expropriate that property. So are there any specific uh, programs uh, targeting black women uh, and these new black women-owned companies and walking them through the copyright process? Well, I think... Um Take creative control is like a really great example. Um, and then we also, there's a government organization called stopfakes.gov, which is focused on small businesses and the Small Business Association helps to run, run it and we participate. That it helps uh, businesses to look and entrepreneurs to look at the whole portfolio, um, right? Because copyright is just one thread. Um, and if you are an entrepreneur and if you are looking to start and leverage something, um, you're looking at multiple threads, and like, and I think the question is like, how do I know what thread I'm looking at, what thread I'm pulling? So I'll also kick it back to Kim, um, because Take Creative Control, I think, looks at that whole, whole portfolio and it helps people introduce it. And so, are there other resources besides beyond Take Creative Control that we should be looking at? So there's different resources in each city. I would high, I would want to highlight that Howard Law School has a clinic mm -hmm. that helps folks, and you can actually get representation for free. They'll help you walk through either trademark consideration, copyright. Um, we also have um, services that we make for, we put forward to folks. They basically come through our intake, and if they need um, additional advice or representation, we look to some of our firm partners for pro bono representation. Um, but there's depending on what city that you're in, there's all sorts of um, different groups. I would say, you know, for artists, I would think of Walla. Um, there's all sorts of different resources out there that are looking to help and lift up um, either small businesses or creators. I would say, given the, at least the, the brief description of the nature of the businesses you gave, it's probably true that trademark is much more important for those businesses than copyright. Um, and so I, I assume and hope that sometimes if somebody brings in a label and says, I would like to copyright this label, that um, somebody from the copyright office says, well, there may be problems with getting a copyright over that graphic design. But that contains, uh, you know, it, it potentially contains a, a, a brand. You should go to the trademark office, and you can get protection for that brand, even if that label graphically is has no copyrightable content whatsoever. So the, there, there are copyrights. Not everything. It's it's a big thing, um, <laughs> but it's not everything. And um, you know, particularly in the interaction with trademark, mm -hmm. um, it's useful for I think copyright folks to understand when trademark may be a better answer than copyright in That's terms right. of protecting folks. And you know, a quick thought, because you've actually given me an idea. You know, I mean, there are resources, but I think part of what you've hit upon is that, yeah, but how do you know where to go to find the resources, right? So something that I think might be really helpful in this regard, because I know that there are major entities in copyright that are very much interested in getting more people, everyday people, 
involved in caring about copyright and understanding how copyright works and having access to it. I think that, and this is obviously not something we can do today, but I can envision um, a, creating a structure whereby industry partnering with the Copyright Office um, to create a, an initial sort of like sub website. Because most people who don't know what to do, the first place they're going to do is they're going to come to the Copyright Office website. So that's the first place where you go to find out, hey, here are a list of, of resources, right, where you can learn more, right? One of those lists, I hope, would be a link to the Institute for Intellectual Property and Social Justice because we can help you learn, learn some stuff. Um, but I think to fuel that, to not only put necessary content on it, but then to develop the secondary resources. Okay, so now I've read. Now who do I go to talk to, right? Obviously, that's going to involve additional resources. And I think that whereas the Copyright Office can serve as the entry gate, which is its role in our society, right? But obviously, it's government. I mean, they can't do the additional heavy lifting because the resources aren't there. But I think that the content industries, they clearly have an interest in this. They want more people, more creators, more individuals to be a part of this system, right? They, they don't want most of us to think about copyright as being some sort of a bad thing, right? And, you know, it's like there's an old, uh, it'll show you how much I'm impacted by like trademark and, and slogans. There's an old um, uh, ad slogan by a clothing uh, company, uh, Sims. I used to love it. They would, they would do those commercials for suits, and at the end, the guy would say, at Sims, an educated consumer is our best customer, right? And when you think about the copyright ecosystem, right, educated creators, and today everybody is a creator, right? Mm -hmm. Educated creators can make the best contribution to copyright activity, copyright industry, and how do you get them? You get them by making certain that they know where to go, to get the information that, that they need. So hopefully, we'll get a chance to act upon your idea. And as Kim said, ideas have value. And you've just given us an incredibly valuable idea. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thanks for hanging out just a little bit longer. Um, I want to thank all of our panelists today for providing such great insight and wisdom. And uh, hopefully, we'll be able to apply it.